Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining Worldwide Technology. My name is Bill Thompson, and joining me is Steve Holler. Uh, today, we're going to talk about in this webinar the software defined revolution, a look at Cisco's SD WAN offering. So, many of you may wonder why are we calling it the revolution? It's because most of the conversations we get around network infrastructure anymore are how do we move to a software defined network, whether it's the access layer, whether it's the WAN side, the data center storage, whatever it may be. It seems that every conversation we have, everyone wants to go to a simpler managed uh, software defined network. So I'd like to start out with some introductions. My name is Bill Thompson. You can ask me about software defined WAN, LAN, Enterprise NFV, any of those technologies. I'm a practice manager on the mobility and access development team. My contact information, if you want to get a hold of me, is on the screen here. I'd like to pass it over to Steve Holler to give a quick introduction. Thanks, Bill. Steve? I'm Steve Holler. I'm a technical solutions architect, and I focus on SD-WAN, SD-Access, and Meraki Full Stack, and my contact information is there as well. Thank you, Steve. And also joining us is Alex Oler. He'll be the chat moderator. If you have any questions you want to ask during our session or our webinar here, please uh, post them to the chat. And if we have time, we'll review some of those questions at the end of the presentation. So with that being said, let's discuss the agenda. We're going to do a quick overview of SD-WAN, kind of what is SD-WAN and why are people looking at it some market trends around the discussions we're having around customer, uh, uh, customer care abouts. What are they interested in and what's new to the SD-WAN market? Steve will give an architecture overview of both the Cisco SD-WAN, formerly known as Viptela solution, and the Meraki solutions. He'll then go through how do you choose the right solution, and then I'll take it back and talk about some of our lab uh, uh, opportunities and, and capabilities we have to get your hands on the solutions. And then we'll cover questions and answers at the end. So with that being said, let's cover an overview of SD-WAN. So I'm sure many of you have heard of it before, but uh, uh, what it is in a nutshell is uh, we have these WAN edge routers just like we have traditionally, but now we're looking at managing them via a controller. So we want to uh, uh, build the brains of the system to go out there and manage potentially thousands of routers via a central portal. In addition to simplified management, it also gives us the ability to run over any network medium like broadband, fiber, LTE, uh, T1 type of connections, over any type of uh, um, uh, service provider connection like an internet versus a private cloud such as MPLS. So, so this is a general overview of what SD-WAN is. But why is it that people are actually looking at it? So we're seeing a lot of customer challenges out there. Uh, believe it or not, many customers still have legacy T1s, uh, which could be very expensive uh, or relatively low bandwidth. Uh, this sometimes is a detractor to support new applications like voice or more video or software as a service applications like Office 365. We're also seeing a trend uh, specifically in retail and healthcare where guest and customer Wi-Fi networks are now becoming a business critical application that increases their brand name. So think about being in a uh, potential hospital and you want to have a great experience in that hospital and maybe sit there and watch Netflix while you're waiting uh, in the patient wait room. Right? So a lot of companies are struggling to support these new uh, customer experiences because of the way they do their uh, WAN technology. So uh, for some of the values uh, for an entire business, by adopting internet as a WAN, organizations can help reduce their WAN costs, maybe go from those T1s that were expensive uh, on a monthly basis, and, and then get even more bandwidth from local service providers. We also want to use SD-WAN to enable workforce productivity. How do I ensure that the applications that are generating my company's revenue are working appropriately over the most optimum service provider? And finally, around improving the customer experience. The uh, example I brought up of a, a person in healthcare joining the customer Wi-Fi, how do we make sure that their experience is as good as possible? 
Now on the IT outcomes, they uh, get a little bit more technical, but we're seeing things that benefit IT uh, uh, in a different way than the business as a whole is benefited. So secure connectivity, how do we make sure that as we onboard more and more guest uh, Wi-Fi that we maybe can't manage their endpoints that are connected? How do we make sure we either maintain or increase our security posture of our network as we start adopting these new uh, type of uh, uh, experiences. In addition to that, we can look at transport and hardware independence. If you've ever tried to move between service providers on a traditional network, it's takes a long time. So how can we make that easy to do and very agile for us to adopt new, uh, uh, less costly uh, type of uh, hardware and service provider circuits? Another option is around bandwidth efficiency. So how can we best utilize all the bandwidth that we're paying for and provide the most optimum experience, not only for our customers, but for our workforce? A lot of this has to do with how do we maintain application performance and, and provide that good experience. And probably the most important IT outcome that we're seeing is the simplicity of operations. Customers are generally tired of managing complex networks and, and managing each of their different devices individually. So the big focus for IT around SD-WAN is how do I manage it simply? So let's talk a little bit about some of the traditional features of SD-WAN. When it first came out three uh, years ago, uh, these are something that all of the vendors share in common, and, and different vendors differentiate more uh, than others in these specific components. So the first one is around transport and hardware independence. Uh, back in the day, we, we saw our uh, SD-WAN as an opportunity to reduce our WAN cost by going from an MPLS to an internet uh, uh, type of uh, service provider circuit. So transport independence creates an overlay network where we can abstract all the routing on the service provider's network. We no longer have to work with them necessarily to advertise all of our corporate or guest networks over that service provider network. It gives us the ability to easily move between service providers. In addition, because of all the software offerings of SD-WAN vendors, we can have that level of hardware independence. Uh, NFB is becoming more and more uh, 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 relevant conversation around SD-WAN and how can we put COTS hardware in, in place and consume an SD-WAN solution. Another component is some level of path intelligence, and this is really about just measuring the performance of the service provider network. We want to go beyond just seeing an up and down of a circuit and see that maybe it has latency that's affecting uh, a particular database application or jitter that's affecting my voice service across that service provider, and then move that traffic uh, through traffic steering of applications based on that performance of the service provider. This gives us a, an additional level of application visibility and control where we can prioritize business critical applications on our network. Now, we want to be able to look deeper into those applications as well, rather than just ports and protocols. We don't want to steer our traffic or prioritize that traffic uh, if it's just simply HTTPS. We want to get more granular about that and be able to differentiate between a business critical uh, uh, system like a point of sale service and social networking like Facebook or LinkedIn. So by getting that granular visibility, we can start steering our traffic and say those social networking sites would use an internet uh, circuit versus a business critical application like point of sale to use in a private cloud circuit like an MPLS. So I'd like to go on, now that we've learned a little bit about what is SD-WAN and why are customers looking at it, I'd like to cover some of the market trends. So, this graph that I'm bringing up here is a graph from uh, Gartner, a forecast on what organizations are going to be looking at SD-WAN as their future. We're at an inflection point here in 2018 where we're seeing a lot of customers are focusing or, or agreeing that SD-WAN is going to be their next generation WAN technology. So in the past, we've had customers that purchase routers just to simply uh, implement BGP or a dynamic routing protocol, basically doing business as usual in there. But we're seeing the majority of our conversations now are about how do I replace that 
and put in an SD-WAN solution that's going to get me a lot of business benefit and IT outcomes. So the majority of the conversations we're having now is no longer just a simple rip and replace of a router. It's around how do I transform my WAN into a software-defined WAN. We see this market increasing where in the future, possibly by 2020, we'll never have those conversations again around just ripping uh, hardware and doing business as usual. We want to make it very easy to do it by making our WAN software-defined. So let's talk a little bit about where are most companies today. So uh, regarding the Fortune 500, uh, we kind of see this journey here where we go from a traditional WAN to educating about software-defined WAN. There's, there's a lot of need for education because it is a big shift in how we manage and build our network. So uh, as part of that education, it leads to usually a proof of concept and then a pilot deployment. However, we're seeing this chasm uh, uh, for a full production uh, deployment by our customers because of several reasons. Believe it or not, with SD-WAN being three or four years old, only about 10% of our customers are in a full production deployment. So why is that? A lot of customers are stuck on different things like IT training and experience. We're no longer managing our WAN like we used to via the CLI on a bunch of devices. Now there may be a change to operations in how I deploy these devices, how I troubleshoot when things go wrong. So there could be some training aspects involved to getting the IT staff up to speed on how to manage it in a full production deployment. Other things that are influencing this is uh, the adoption of a cloud strategy. We're seeing a lot of customers start to move uh, different applications and services to the cloud, and they're asking, how does this affect my SD-WAN strategy? How can I enable my SD-WAN that uh, uh, gets me to where I want to be in the cloud? Other things like InfoSec are a big uh, component as well that's uh, uh, influencing how quickly we can roll out to uh, production networks, especially when I talk about the example of being able to access Netflix out there. How do we provide the same level of security at our branch offices that we did in our data center when we're letting people go out and surf Netflix directly out of the branch? How do I put and manage those security components into the branch? Another topic we're seeing that, that kind of influences the ability to roll to full production is application analytics. So I have some visibility now into granular applications like social networking, but I want to know more about how and who is using those applications. What is the experience while they're using it? And then another detractor, believe it or not, is reliance on bandwidth. So how can I potentially reduce costs and reduce bandwidth potentially by uh, you know, using it across multiple circuits, there's a lot of planning when it comes to bandwidth reliance that, that are preventing companies from going to a pro full production uh, uh, rollout. Now, many of our customers today are still in a proof of concept phase. We, uh, in our labs, we're, it's almost constant that we're having a proof of concept around some SD-WAN technology before it even gets to a pilot uh, uh, rollout there. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the changing conversation. So earlier I talked about the four components that are common uh, across the different SD-WAN vendors, but increasingly we're seeing conversations less around the transport independence, the path intelligence, and we're seeing it more around how do I integrate with the cloud? How does this fit into my strategy to adopt software as a service like O365 or platform as a service like uh, Microsoft uh, Azure or Amazon AWS. So how does that SD-WAN solution fit in? A lot of our uh, uh, conversations revolve around this. Believe it or not, WAN optimization is still a conversation we're having, although it's changed a little bit from the traditional uh, conversation we've had around uh, data deduplication and compression. We're seeing more around TCP optimization for specific applications like uh, uh, virtual desktop images or caching. How do I make sure that those iPhone updates don't consume all of my bandwidth? Other conversations around specific security functions at the branch. I mentioned this before, but how do I put IPS or 
content filtering or malware protection at the branch level, and, and more importantly, how do I manage all those functions across the branch because I'm going to a more distributed model rather than a, uh, a centralized model. Uh, this is to help support direct internet access for not only our customers like guest uh, uh, Wi-Fi access, but also for those O365 and AWS offerings. And then lastly, around the analytics portion. So most of these conversations have to do with analytics as well. How do I know? I know the applications that are being used in SD-WAN, but tell me how they're operating. So lots of discussions around there. So I'd like to talk for a moment about the top drivers for SD-WAN. So once again, why are customers looking at SD-WAN and why is it that the majority of them believe that SD-WAN is the future of WAN, uh, 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 WAN software defined? So there's really six different uh, reasons why companies as a whole are looking at SD-WAN. Transport hardware independence, application intelligence, Architecture flexibility, give me the ability to move between different solutions, service providers, hardware. Uh, uh, SD-WAN gives us that ability. Software-defined networking, going to a controller-based model. WAN degradation handling, how do I handle when there is uh, performance issues on a service provider circuit? And then IT deployment and operations with the simplicity. So these are the things that are moving customers towards an SD-WAN solution. But when it comes to actually choosing a, the right vendor for your organization, we're seeing two stand out in terms of determining who the, you know, who the uh, uh, SD-WAN option I'm going with is. And that's around how the SD-WAN vendor handles the degradation on the WAN, and then most importantly around IT deployment and operations. Believe it or not, when it gets into proof of concepts where there's multiple vendors being compared, it almost always comes down to the simplicity of using their particular solution. So with that being said, I'd like to pass off to Steve Holler to give an architecture overview of Cisco's SD-WAN solution and the Meraki SD-WAN solution. So Steve? Thanks, Bill. So next we'll look at the architecture of each solution. And one thing you'll notice with SD-WAN is there's some commonality in how we're designing networks today. So with a lot of the different SD-WAN solutions, you've seen the decoupling of the data plane and the control plane. And what that allows us to do is really have, you know, a more scalable infrastructure where each router is not having to participate and learn all the routing updates. They can just check in with a common controller. So if you look at how that applies to the Cisco SD-WAN environment, the data plane is really the V-Edge routers that you'll see at the bottom of the screen. So these behave much like traditional routers. This is where all your secure connectivity is built between routers at your site. And those sites could be between your remote locations, your data centers, and even your cloud applications. So if you're hosting things in the public cloud like Amazon or Azure, you can also have virtual versions of the V-Edge there. So generally speaking, if you hear the term V-Edge, we're referring normally to the hardware platforms. So there's several different options there based on bandwidth. And then if you hear the term V-Edge Cloud, that's the virtual option. So that can run within the public cloud infrastructure, and it can also run in your environment. So it supports uh, common hypervisors like KVM and ESXi. So if you look at the hardware for the router, really they're um, available, you know, all the way up to uh, 20 gigs, so, you know, 100 meg to 20 gigs, so it gives you a lot of flexibility for deployment. As we kind of move up the stack and look at the vSmart controllers, this is the centralized control plane. So here, this would be responsible for all your policies, so if you define a particular policy, it'll be applied to the controller. It'll also be where all your routing updates occur. So with this control plane technology, we're able to use the OMP or overlay management protocol to automatically bring up the overlay without a lot of user intervention. So as devices come online, they can establish connectivity, build their IPsec tunnels, exchange routes, and learn the policy all through the vSmart controllers. Additionally, this is where we control BFD or bidirectional forward detection where we can test really the quality of a link. So that's where we can see is that link and the underlay degraded and keep track of all that information. The, the control plane helps us with that as well. Then vManage is the management plane on top of all this. So this is your network management 
basically your dashboard. So it gives you an overall view of the network health. So you can see, you know, are any of my devices down or not having, you know, complete connectivity? Am I seeing any kind of issue at certain sites? What are my top applications? All of this is available from the vManage or from like the dashboard where you can see what's going on. Additionally, this provides a centralized management function. So with that, you can have a VS that you can configure locally or you can put it in vManage mode. So with vManage mode, you're able to build out templates that you can apply to multiple devices. So this allows you to set different types of templates, maybe small, medium, and large, and then you have a common and consistent configuration throughout your whole infrastructure. So with that, you can also um, manage the routers locally, but if you have them in vManage mode, if you go in and try to actually make a configuration change and hit commit, it's going to give you an error message say it's managed by vManage. So this really gives you your complete control of the config through one common interface. The next piece is the vBond orchestrator. So this one can kind of you know, be a little bit harder to understand because it's not a component that we've had traditionally within the infrastructure. The purpose of the vBond orchestrator primarily is for the onboarding of new devices for the overlay. So it's responsible for all the authentication and you know, making sure that the routers are approved or the V edges are approved to connect to this network. And it also handles all the load balancing to the vSmart controller. So it basically directs you to the right controller so that you're able to receive your configuration. And then finally, B Analytics is a cloud-based analytics platform that gives you really deep visibility into the different applications, the different service provider metrics. So do you have a certain providers that behave poorly? But it gives you a lot deeper analytics into your entire environment versus just that overview that you get from vManage. So those are integrated together where you can get a really rich analytical view of your whole system. So if we look at some of the components in detail, one of the main things about Cisco SD-WAN is the secure connectivity. So as we bring up the tunnels, um, you know, you can run these as GRE, but most people run them as IPsec for security. Within the IPsec uh, tunnel, we can actually create secure segments. So if you're familiar with the term VRF or virtual routing and forwarding, in Cisco SD-WAN, the term VPN is very similar. So what this allows us to have is a separate uh, data plane separation where we have, you know, routing tables for VPN1 that are separate from routing tables for VPN2. So this really helps to create a secure segmented environment end to end, regardless of whatever the underlay technology is. So the way that we map different types of traffic to a VPN can either be through a specific interface, through a sub interface, or even through a VLAN. So then that will map and then it will use a label to carry that completely segmented throughout the data plane, and then you can actually receive it on the other side. So this will set it up where if you have a connection to a remote site, maybe it's going to some sort of point of sale machine, it can be in its own VLAN segmented maybe from your guest traffic, providing secure separation between the different types of traffic that are using the overlay. So one of the really cool things about this um, segmentation is you can define it based on you know, whatever topology you need. So you can have a VPN that may have a full mesh topology, and, you know, that would be helpful for real-time applications, voice and video, for example, where they need to have reachability to all your sites. So as you define what VPN is, the VPN1 in this example, you could have a full mesh where everything can be part of that. And then if you had other um, applications that went back to the data center, you could set that up as a hub and spoke. So as the topology is built, these tunnels are established. They're not data-driven. They're established ahead of time. So we want to make sure that, you know, we give it the right type of connectivity. And it also helps from a security standpoint. So maybe you have certain sites that don't need access to certain VPNs. You can really control the flow of that traffic across your whole organization. So with this, you're actually able to build whatever topology type you need. So these are just some examples. But if you had a site that just needed to connect to another site, you could establish a tunnel between those two sites without having to go figure out, hey, you know, I need to get something to do an IPsec tunnel or maybe I need a different solution. There's a lot of flexibility in here to say, hey, I just need a tunnel. So maybe you spin up a new VPN between those two sites and you have a point-to-point -point connection. It also gives us a lot of flexibility in how we design security. So as we look at, you know, the traditional security models where all the traffic flowed back to the data center, you could also start to have regional hubs where we could build a partial mesh. So maybe 
certain sites connected to certain regional hubs for internet breakout, but other sites didn't connect to those hubs because they may be in a different geography or based on load or compliance. So it really gives us a lot of variation in terms of topology, and then we're able to map that to each VPN so it can have its own topology. So one of the core tenets of SD-WAN is being able to detect if a link's degraded. So as we start to move away from, you know, connections like MPLS where, you know, the provider is giving us an SLA or a service level agreement, as we start using other types of connection, especially internet, uh, 4G LTE, these don't come with any type of guarantees in terms of performance. So with SD-WAN, we can build out our own SLAs from a router standpoint where we can choose exactly what's going to happen to that traffic. So by default, all traffic's load balanced across all the available links within the Cisco SD-WAN solution. You can influence that so it may prefer, you know, if your internet's bigger where we send more of the traffic there, but we can use everything in an active-active fashion. Then you have the ability to granularly go in and say, hey, for my voice application, you know, if I start to see, you know, delay or, excuse me, latency of greater than 150 milliseconds, then I want to avoid using that link. So in this example, we've built an application where policy between, you know, the, the Cisco SD-WAN router, the ISR router, and the VEDGE where it notices that I'm starting to experience latency greater than 150 milliseconds, so that traffic's going to avoid that path. But all the other traffic will continue using that path, so maybe a file transfer may be delayed, but we can still take advantage of that bandwidth, so we're not completely pulling it out of service, but we're also ensuring that the applications that are affected by whatever it is that's affecting that policy, you know, from an end user standpoint, we're routing around that so nobody knows that there's anything going on with the underlying infrastructure. So with that, um, with the Cisco SD-WAN solution, there's a lot of different features and functionality that you can benefit from. Those are just some of the high level features but moving forward, there's going to be, you know, a lot of discussions around cloud. So as software as a service becomes more, you know, entrenched in different organizations, you can build out what's called Cloud Express where we can actually probe and see, you know, what is the actual performance like going to an application like Office 365. And if that particular application is struggling in a particular internet um, breakout, that may be at a centralized data center or regional location or even locally at the, the remote site, we can actually send that traffic through a different internet connection. So we have the ability to actually monitor and then respond to any type of, you know, challenge that we're seeing with the software as a service application. Additionally, there's uh, functionality like cloud on ramp where we can automate the bring up within an Amazon uh, AWS environment. So all you have to do is put in your credentials and your key and it will go out and install the edges and build out that environment for you through API. So there's a lot of functionality in how those things fit together. So with that, next we're going to look at the Meraki solution and how it applies to SD-WAN. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Meraki, Meraki has a cloud-based management for their uh, infrastructure that is accessible from anywhere. So if you go to the Meraki dashboard and log in with your user account, you'll see all the networks that are assigned to that email address. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. If you were trying to manage this network, you wouldn't have to drive into the office or connect to a VPN. We can access the dashboard from anywhere via the internet. So with that, it gives us a very rich management function. So that's the management and also really the control plane. So from there, there's a lot of options in terms of Meraki. So the Meraki MX portfolio is basically a firewall router combination. So it provides all the SD-WAN functionality, but it's also a full featured firewall. So we refer to that sometimes as a UTM or unified threat management. So it includes firewall, IPS, content filtering, even Cisco advanced malware protection as an option there. So with that, you can also have switches and access points at, at your sites that are also managed from dashboard so you get a very nice uh, visibility view of everything that's going on in your environment. You can see a client all the way from the AP through the switch and into the MX and even across the network into other sites and have very rich, deep and rich visibility across your entire infrastructure. 
So some other areas that Meraki has different equipment is around cameras. You can do surveillance cameras. They offer phones and they offer uh, mobile device management through Systems Manager. So it really gives you a full featured IT portfolio that you can deploy very widely within your organization. So specifically for today, I wanted to focus in on the connectivity options. So the Meraki MX line is a very strong security appliance, but we also want to look at what does it offer us in terms of capability. So one thing is the ST-WAN option gives us the ability to start looking at links. So we can do active-active load balancing. We can start to manage the performance. Is there something, you know, lost latency jitter? So those functions are built into the Meraki MX, and they're actually included in the standard enterprise license. So there's no special licensing required to enable those features. The next thing is with the VPN solution, it is able to bring up a VPN between different MX devices very simply because they know about each other through the cloud management. So literally in the Meraki dashboard, it's just a radio button. You say, do I want VPN off? Do I want to do a full mesh or do I want to do a hub and spoke? So you just select the type of topology that you want and you literally just click that and click save. And it does all the work behind the scenes to bring up that IPsec VPN. So there's a lot of uh, cool things around that where we can start to say, now what's the help of the VPN? You can go in and see what's my traffic between sites. So there's a lot of deep and rich analytics that come of that out of the box once you enable it. In terms of routing, uh, auto VPNing takes care of all the routing between all the different sites and the overlay. And then once you get to like your data center, we're able to use either OSPF or BGP advertisements to exchange routes with that local router. So you can tell it, these are all my remote sites, this is where everything's located. So it does have routing functionality to exchange information about all the remote sites in your environment. So, from there, you can do uh, load balancing. So you can say, I want to use you know, all, both links that I have available. And then you can build policy because you can see you know, what are my top applications, what are people doing. You may identify, hey, all my Microsoft Windows updates are taking a lot of bandwidth. So you can actually go in and build policy around that to ensure that, that no one type of traffic gets an you know, uh, unfair share of the bandwidth. So you can really build out priority to make sure that we're utilizing the bandwidth efficiently. You can also traffic shape. So you could say uh, client, you know, maybe they can only do a maximum of five megabits, no matter what client. Or you can say, I'm gonna allow Netflix because, you know, I'm a hospital and I want patients to be able to watch Netflix, but I may want to, you know, minimize the impact of the network. So I may say all the Netflix and traffic in my network can't go above five megabits total. So it gives you a lot of out of the box um, capabilities in terms of shaping and policy and again, it's all GUI driven, so it's really easy to learn. Finally, it gives you connectivity options. So you can do up to two WAN connections, and then you also have the option to add a USB modem for 4G LTE failover. So if you have a site and you're, and you're bringing it up, it can run off of the LTE connection. And then as your WAN connections come in, like if you're waiting on a provider to install a connection, then those would be primarily active unless both WAN links failed, and then it would fail back over to the LTE modem. So if we look at the Meraki SD-WAN features a little more deeply, it does give you that active-active flow across the VPN, and it also gives you that dynamic path selection based on the performance metrics of loss latency and jitter. So this allows you to build you know, different routing schemes. So you can say, hey, maybe all my software updates, I want that to go across WAN2, which may be a higher bandwidth connection. And if you know, that connection fails, maybe I want that to fail over to WAN1. But if you have voice traffic, maybe you want your voice traffic to say, hey, if I see, you know, loss of greater than 150 milliseconds, then I want that to only use the connection that's good. So it will active, active load balance across the two WAN connections unless there's some sort of performance issue. And then it will dynamically choose a better path to ensure that end user experience remains high. So in this example, traditionally in, in kind of a steady state, WAN 1 would be active because everything is good, we're meeting our metrics. But if something were to happen where we go below that threshold, the traffic would actually fall over to WAN2.
So what's really cool about this is if you're familiar with Meraki, um, the application engine that's built into it, they've had it for a number of years and it's, it's phenomenal. And you can search for an application type like video, or you can specifically choose a particular application like YouTube. So with this application engine, and if you've ever used the built-in layer seven firewall rule or built a policy with Meraki, it's the same database, which should feel very familiar. And you can use it to build out path preferences. So in terms of SD-WAN, we can use this database to start to create, you know, the, the policy for our different applications. So if you had voice traffic, you could build a policy where it's active active. So it's using both WAN connections. And with that policy, you can say for all my voice traffic, if I have performance issues where I have lost links to your jitter, I can set a threshold where it's going to fill over and just use a single link instead of being active active. You can also use it to build uh, policies for uh, applications to take particular paths, such as software updates. You can say, I want all my software updates to use WAN2 because it has more bandwidth. And then if that link goes down, then it would fill over to WAN1. So what this gives us is really a strong security footprint in terms of, of Meraki MX is where we have firewall features, IPS and content filtering, all these things built in. But we also have these advanced routing and SD-WAN capabilities that are all built on a common application database. So it really gives us a nice way to start building out policies, both for security and routing through um, the co one common interface through Meraki dashboard. So the next thing that we wanna look at is, is how do we actually choose the right solution? So there's a number of SD-WAN vendors in the market, and there's a couple of key areas that we focus on, you know, as we look at which vendor is the right solution for a particular customer. So if we look at kind of the, the common things, you know, one of the things that we really look at is, is total cost of ownership. And that's not just like your hardware and, and software cost, it's also looking at, you know, what is the you know, supportability of it? Like, you know, how much does it cost from a support standpoint? But it's also how easy it is, is it for my staff to become comfortable with it? So you look at, you know, training and, and you know, with these newer solutions, like both with Cisco SD-WAN and with Meraki, we have cloud-based management. So we don't have to create, you know, all this management infrastructure uh, to be able to support the WAN. A lot of that is in the cloud. So with that cloud-based management, it also gives us the ability to do zero-touch provisioning. So now we can bring up sites really quickly. As long as they can connect to the internet, they can actually, you know, uh, log in, pull their config, and then be online ready to go. So you don't have to actually, like, turn that into a device anymore and copy a config. So we can really automate and bring these sites up really, really quickly. So it makes it easy to deploy. And then having a common uh, centralized single pane of glass through dashboards, we now have a really easy way to manage it. So we can see you know, what's going on in the network. We can look and see you know, what are my top applications. You can also you know, build out you know, all your templates and, and configurations and even build out your policy from one common location that, that spans the entire WAN. So, each vendor has a little bit different view on how these things fit together, um, but these are some of the things that we look at. And one of the things that I really like to focus on is where are these things going? So the SD-WAN market is changing pretty rapidly. So we like to think about kind of the next step, like what's coming next? And really, you know, looking at, you know, what's the cloud strategy? How are we going to support, you know, software as a service? What kind of APIs and programmability are built in where we can start to automate tasks? So, you know, as you think about not only what, what are the features that you have today, but also looking at where things are going in the future. So, you know, if we build on that and say, what, what in terms of Cisco SD-WAN portfolio, you know, what's kind of the, the main, you know, um, differences in the capability. So from a Meraki standpoint, you really have a common uh, centralized management for multiple IT systems. So it's not just the, the Meraki MX that gives you security and routing, but you can also have a single pane of glass management for switching and wireless in their whole portfolio. And with their uh, SD-WAN solution, you have all these built-in security features. So you have, you know, a firewall and IPS and advanced malware protection all out of the box in addition to a feature-rich SD-WAN solution. In terms of Vitella or Cisco SD-WAN, you know, this is really more of a, um, a you know, routing-based solution where you have a little bit more capabilities around you know, how do I tweak some different variables so it has a little more customi customization. You know, where Meraki's folks focused on simplicity with Cisco SD-WAN, we have more things that we can actually customize and tweak if you had specific requirements. So some of the other things are we can support more than three, two, you know, three WAN connections. With Meraki, we can only do two. 
And uh, the teller assist OS2 win also offers an option to have on premise management. So, Meraki is only cloud based. With the teller, you can have cloud or on prem management. One of the other you know, main differences with Cisco SD WAN is you can run it as a virtual networking function. So they have a version of the V Edge that can run on you know, ES6I for VMware or in Azure AWS in the public cloud environment. With Meraki, there's a, a virtual MX that runs both in AWS and Azure, but there's no VMware ES6I support. So if you're doing your kind of a NF model, uh, with virtual networking functions, then you know Cisco SD WAN will be able to support it. If you look kind of collectively, though, they, they both support you know a very scalable solution that supports thousands of sites with zero touch provisioning. Uh, they have options for LTE, both for backup and as WAN connectivity, um, and and they both support your know, cloud-based management. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bill to review the different ATC class, uh, capabilities that we have available uh, around SD-WAN. Okay. Thank you, Steve. So, uh, uh, as Steve mentioned, I'd like to give you an overview of what our Advanced Technology Center is. So, this is a place where we develop our expertise, like where uh, Steve was able to get his hands on different types of equipment like uh, uh, Vitella and Meraki and find out how those different SD-WAN solutions fit in there. So our Advanced Technology Center is used not only to develop experience with us, but also to allow customers to consume some of the same resources that are in our labs. Uh, uh, so this could be used for anything from testing of new technologies to demos of the technologies to getting your hands on it and even to a proof of concept where you might want to try and see how this particular solution integrates with your existing network. So uh, the way we build these lab environments are, out are from the ground up. So we focus on those foundational technologies like Cisco Wireless or Meraki Wireless, and then we might throw in the switching aspect and, and then move on to the WAN type of solutions like Vitella SD-WAN or Meraki SD-WAN, and then of course the data center as well. And then from there, we start layering different features on top. So how can I use those foundational architectures to, to, to build a more holistic system? So integrate all my LAN switching and wireless into a single fabric and, and, and create my SD-WAN solution, and then a software-defined data center as well. Above there, we can use the different automation aspects that make uh, uh, management of these different architectures very simple. And then from there, we move up the stack into an enterprise architecture where we're now looking at our network not as a wireless network or an SD-WAN or a software-defined data center, but we want this to be a holistic enterprise architecture where we can start integrating other things like security mechanisms such as uh, uh, segmentation. Ultimately, what all of these different things layered together from the ground up result in is these business outcomes, things such as customer experience, workforce productivity, agile IT, which we've been kind of talking about how do we make the uh, operations experience much more easy for the network folks that are managing these networks. So. On the SD-WAN side, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about what type of offerings we have in our Advanced Technology Center. So, so our traditional approach to SD-WAN has been to start out with a workshop. So this is to uh, uh, discuss with you and find out what's important, what are some of the goals you're trying to achieve with the SD-WAN solution, and then maybe give you demos of uh, uh, Vitella's SD-WAN and Cisco's Meraki. And this is nothing more to prove that the technology actually works. Now, we realize that this is a big uh, uh, disruptive in industry in SD-WAN, and it's a big shift to operations. So a lot of our focus is around building trust in that technology, and the best way to do that is to get your hands on uh, these environments. So we have what we refer to as a sandbox environment. These are I isolated environments that you can consume and go in and, and, and break things and really get in and, and follow lab guides we've developed or go off the rails and test your own thing. Uh, and, and it's all for you, right? 
the, uh, uh, so some of the environments we have today are Cisco SD-WAN, including Vitella. Uh, we have the Cisco iWAN for the customers that still have iWAN out there and maybe need to do some testing or, or even figure out how the migration from iWAN to a Vitella or a Meraki environment works. We're also developing an on-demand environment for uh, Cisco Meraki. Now, what's key to these on-demand environments is that you don't have to wait to schedule this and wait behind others that are already in line. I can simply launch this environment and you can have it as quickly as we can put in your email address. From building the trust around the sandbox, we move to a custom environment. So now you've seen demos of the technologies, you know they work, you've gotten your hands on and built some trust. Next step is to figure out how these environments are going to in integrate into your existing uh, uh, architecture. So things like how is my Vitella environment going to talk to my wireless infrastructure that's in a branch or, or how do I use my SD-WAN solution with Meraki to get my, my users out to the applications that sit in the data center. This is where we can build a custom environment, help you build that uh, uh, interoperability testing. We can use realistic traffic using industry standard testing tools to simulate exactly what's going on on your network and then give you the ability to evaluate the whole branch and, and find out how is that migration path to SD-WAN going to work for you. So how do you engage WWT to get your hands on some of these environments or just have those uh, technical deep dives that we referenced? So we have many resources available. As I mentioned, we start out with a uh, workshop, but uh, uh, you can also go and consume some of these capabilities and maybe find out about some of our other capabilities through the ATC Connect app. This is available on both the App Store and Google Play, and you'll get to see some of the SD-WAN solutions I talked about earlier, and then other solutions like DNA Center or uh, SD Access. Uh, you can, of course, to consume these, contact your WWT account team, but if you can't get a hold of them, feel free to reach out to some of the uh, subject matter experts on the uh, screen here, Neil Anderson, Tom Shepherds, or myself. So we would love the opportunity to present to your teams uh, and provide more demos or get your hands on the SD-WAN environments. So with that said, we've reviewed a lot of the chat questions and they're quite complex uh, questions that can't be answered very quickly. So uh, we will reach out to all the people that ask the questions and, and answer those individually and start a conversation around uh, uh, some of your questions. So thank you everyone and thank you for joining WWT for the SD-WAN webinar.